<coughs> Chairman of the Arctic Circle, Mr. Olavur Ragnar Grimsson, former president of Iceland, excellencies, distinguished guests. The, it's an honor to be here yet again today. The Arctic Circle Assembly has become a vital forum for a joint reflection on the state of the Arctic. And this is a venue for constructive dialogue between the diverse actors that shape that region. Iceland has consistently called for a peaceful and cooperative regime in the Arctic. Increased geopolitical tensions in the region is a deplorable development and highlights the fact that there is no specific Arctic forum to deal with hard security, territorial disputes or the exploitation of natural resources. It is our collective responsibility to ensure peace and stability in the North Atlantic and the Arctic, preventing the area from falling prey to misguided geopolitical wrestling. Throughout this year's chairmanship of the Arctic Council, Iceland has worked towards strengthening it as the main intergovernmental forum on Arctic affairs. We have put focus on green solutions in the area, people and communities of the Arctic, and the Arctic marine environment. IPCC's latest report on the ocean and the cryosphere reveals that climate change is progressing even faster than previously anticipated. The report highlights the challenges of rising sea temperatures and the melting of ice, both of which have severe consequences for the Arctic. The oceans absorb around a quarter of carbon emissions and soak up 90% of excess heat. Sea ice is receding rapidly here in the north. Ecosystems move towards the poles with warming trends affecting fisheries and livelihoods. With over two degrees of global warming, the Arctic as we know it will change beyond recognition. Simultaneously, ocean acidification is a real and serious threat to marine life, rendering coastal communities, including Iceland, extremely vulnerable. Cold polar waters acidify more quickly, and some of the most rapid trends in the world have been measured north of Iceland. It is no wonder that when I meet Icelandic fishermen, their main concern is climate change these days. And they, really let, they are really following the politics of the world and asking what will you do to ensure the livelihood of the oceans. Acidification will not be halted without significantly curbing carbon emissions. There is no alternative solution. A couple of months ago, I, months ago, I joined an international group of artists and scientists, along with Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, and fierce campaigner for climate justice. And together we went to bid farewell to the former glacier in Iceland called Ork. The ice field that covered the mountain in 1900 has now been replaced by a crater lake. It is certainly beautiful, but that beauty quickly fades in the eyes of anyone who knows what was there before and why it is no longer there. Glaciers are melting across the world contributing enormously to rising sea levels and disrupting natural systems. Himalayan glaciers help regulate the water supply of a quarter of humankind, to take one example. The melting of ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica would result in dozens of feet of sea level rise. Scientists cannot pinpoint at what level the melting of Greenland or the West Antarctica ice sheets becomes irreversible but it will become irreversible unless we do something about it. The fact that the Arctic is warming at a rate of almost twice the global average should be alarming to all of us. Many of us here will live to see ice-free summers in the Arctic Ocean. Nature, ecosystems and communities will be transformed. And we cannot convene here at the Arctic Circle without taking notice. I applaud the leadership of mayors and elected leaders from northern local governments that earlier today founded the Arctic Mayors Forum. The forum will offer a platform for, for Arctic local communities to be formally involved in policy decision making regarding the area. I also hope that the mayoral collaboration contributes, contributes to peace and stability in the Arctic. That should be in the shared interest of all stakeholders. 
Ladies and gentlemen, everywhere around the world, young people have been demonstrating for months. Their movement is based on the findings and guidance of science, which should be an encouragement to all of us. We should listen carefully to the many groups of young people who skip school to strike for the climate, to the people who gather outside our parliaments week after week, month after month. They demand action from the politics, and the politics need to be aware that the solutions to the climate crisis need to be just. We need to think about them in the terms of equality, of human rights, and justice within countries and between countries. We need to be mindful of the fact that wealthy countries have contributed to the most of have contributed the most to climate change, but tend to be most immune to its effects. 100 companies are supposed to have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since the late 1980s. Furthermore, as recently revealed, 20 fossil fuel companies can be directly linked to more than one third of all greenhouse gas emissions in the modern world. 12 of these companies are state owned. The world's largest companies need to take responsibility. Individualized policies to halt climate change, individuals trying to eat less red meat, use a bicycle, choose an electric vehicle. All of these are important, but not sufficient against a problem facing humanity as a whole. And it is our task to change that. We need to build green well-being economies that work for the health of the planet and the long-term well-being of all people as well as future generations. Last month, I addressed the Climate Action Summit convened by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. The summit built a momentum, most notably on carbon neutrality and nature-based solutions. It also triggered significant new commitments. Climate change will only be confronted with robust action and generous international collaboration. My government has adopted a fully funded action plan on climate change, aiming at carbon neutrality in Iceland by 2040. The national government and the municipalities in the Greater Reykjavik area have agreed on a transport infrastructure investment plan of an unprecedented scale, aimed at lowering the carbon footprint of ground transport in the capital area. Also, the government is heading for an energy system in the transport system as a whole. We have also scaled up investment in nature-based solutions aimed at restoring soil, forest and wetland ecosystems and to enhance their carbon storage capacity. Also, the government has initiated a joint platform of cooperation with the private sector on climate change and green solutions, something that we can also be inspired of by the Arctic Circle, because we won't achieve any results without the clear collaboration between the public and the private sector. And I am very happy to say that the private sector in Iceland has been very positive and welcomed that initiative. The Nordic Prime Ministers have agreed on a declaration on Nordic climate neutrality, paving the way for further international commitment to halt climate change. We took that pledge forward in our meeting here in Iceland last August, jointly with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Our August meeting also saw a collaboration with Nordic CEOs who pledged concerted action to tackle climate change. This is just to remind us that while governments and international organizations play a vital part in halting climate change, businesses need to step up as well. Dear guests, I have attended the Arctic Circle for many years, and I know this room is full of hope and concerns for the future of the Arctic. We represent different interests, different politics, different ideas. But we should all be united in the will to protect the Arctic and provide a sustainable future for the local populations in the area, as well as for our ecosystems. The task is massive, but the solutions exist. It is ours to get the job done and inspire hope, because hope is needed. I wish you a good and constructive conversation in the coming days. Thank you.